morning. Everyone can hear me okay? All right. You may not know the name of Robert Simon, but he was involved in finding and helping the world restore the most expensive painting that has ever sold in 2015, 2017, excuse me. It all started back in 2005 when a painting was acquired for less than a $10,000 by Simon and his group of art dealers. They were in New Orleans at an auction and bought this painting. The dealers believed that the painting was Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi, savior of the world. And so they were willing to invest just a small sum. But the painting had this difficult past. It was heavily overpainted. It looked like a knockoff version. It was a version that they thought that the students of Leonardo got their hands on and put too much paint and too much color in the wrong places and actually ruined the painting. In fact, at the time it was sold for $10,000, the painting was described as a wreck, dark and gloomy. It was a painting that you wouldn't even want to put it on your wall. But the people that were experts thought that there was something inside that painting that needed to come out, that it was an original created by a master, and it was too valuable to just throw away, even though in 1958, when it was probably brought to the States for the first time, it only sold for $62.50. But when Simon and his group saw it, they thought, let's invest at least $10,000 in it, and they purchased it. Then they took that painting to Diane Dyer Modestini, probably the world's foremost restorer of original art, who lived in New York City. She took the painting, and she worked three years in trying to restore it, to bring it back to life. She took layers and layers of excessive paint off of it. At about, about the end of her journey on this painting, the artist dealers and the licensed people and the people who certify original arts started to come by and they, they said to themselves, we think this is really an authentic masterpiece by Leonardo painted in 15 AD. The painting's not large, it's only 26 inches high and 19 inches wide, but it has been on an economic ride ever since. 1958 sold for $62.50. Simon bought it for less than $10,000. About four years later, Simon and his group sold it for $75 million. Well, three years later after that, the guy who bought it sold it for $127.5 million. And then in, nine, in November 15, 2017, the painting was sold at the Christie's auction for $450 million.3 dollars, setting a record at the time. It was bought by an Arab sheik. And that's the painting, Salvatore Mundi, savior of the world. He's dressed in Renaissance clothes. He's holding a globe in his hand. If you've trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's a story of your life. That painting is a story of who you are. If you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, you haven't put your faith in Him, you haven't asked Him to come into your life and to save you from your sins and to give you a new life and create you anew, the first part of that story is a story of your life. You see, when the Master of all Masters, the Triune God, 
created Adam and Eve in the garden, he created a masterpiece. They were perfect. There was nothing that was wrong with Adam and Eve. They were in this beautiful, perfect garden. They themselves were perfect as creating the first creation of humankind by God. And they were unashamed, and they had everything that they could ever want. And so it was a beautiful thing for them. But then Adam and Eve listened to the devil's lies. He listened to, they listened to the deceit. And it's like they took their paintbrushes, and it's like they dipped them into the concoction of sin, transgression, and rebellion. And it's like they took that brush loaded with that sin, and they smeared it all over the canvases of their body, both inside and out degrading and overpainting the work that God wanted initially. And from that point on, the children of Adam and Eve, and subsequently every child in the world, is born in the sin and is marked indelibly by sin and transgression and rebellion. Adam and Eve were once masterpieces but they became a wreck, dark and gloomy, as we all have. If you look in your Bibles in Ephesians chapter 2, you'll find it uh, a pulpit Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, we'd like you to take that one as our gift. On page 814, 814, we're going to look briefly at Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 10, but the thing that we're going to park on, the verse that we're going to park on today is Ephesians 2.10. But for a little bit of context, this is our story today. And if you look in Ephesians 2.1, you'll see that everyone has been born in trespasses and sins. And we follow the Spirit who works in disobedience in every unregenerate soul. And we are by nature children of wrath, children of disobedience. This is who we are. But if you have not trusted Christ as your personal Savior, and you are described as a child of wrath, living in disobedience, and your life would be, des be described as a wreck, dark and gloomy, without hope, I want you to know that you can have hope today. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, But God. You hear that intervention? God intervenes. But God, being rich in mercy, withholding what is due you, eternal death, because of his great love with which he loved you, even when you were in your you were dead in your trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You see, God the Father planned that the eternal Son, Jesus, would come to earth as a perfect God-man, the masterpiece of perfection. And he came to earth to restore the image that was marred and destroyed by Adam and Eve's rebellion to give us a new life, to re remove the power and penalty of sin, and then to eradicate the presence of sin when he comes again in glory. That's what Jesus did when he came to earth. And so God caused the old batter pitcher to be born again from a wreck, from a place that was dark and gloomy to a priceless, inestimable treasure, bright and cheery. That's what Jesus did. And you can receive God's grace this morning by acknowledging that you are a wreck and that you need Jesus in your life. 
God wants to pour the cleansing power of His grace and forgiveness. He wants to pour the cleansing power of His blood that washes away sins. And He wants to take His brush and place it in His blood and then rub it on your canvas and bring restoration and recreation to you and revive your spirit. If you've never trusted Christ, please come and talk with me afterwards or Pastor Lynn. We'd love to tell you how you can have a clean heart and be moved from the domain of darkness into the domain of the kingdom of light, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that when God saves, there's nothing in salvation about you. You cannot save yourself. You cannot work for it. In the steps of restorative salvation, it is all done by the grace of God. God the Father starts the process by drawing you to himself. John 6.44 says, No one comes to the Father except when God draws him. So God draws you into a relationship with himself. And then the Holy Spirit begins to convict you as you're on the way being drawn. He will convict you of your sin. He will convict you of the need that you need to think about Jesus, that you need to have a relationship with him. John 3.27 says, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. And then Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 indicates that God even gives us the grace and gives us the faith that we need to believe in him. I'm sure it takes our faith, but God prompts us and gives us the faith that we need. We choose God because he gave us the grace. There's nothing that we can do for ourselves. John Stott, he says, the grace neither is an achievement not of your own doing nor a reward for any of your deeds of religion and philanthropy not because of works since therefore there is no room for human merit there is no room for human boasting either salvation is a gift of God's grace Philip Yancey describes what grace is. Grace means there is nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's no amount of spiritual calisthenics. There's no amount of renunciations. No amount of knowledge gained from seminaries. No amount of crusading on behalf of righteous causes. And grace means that there's nothing you can do that will cause God to love you less. No amount of racism or pride, pornography or adultery, not even murder. Grace means that God already loves you as much as an infinite God could possibly love. He sent Jesus, and that's the expression of that love. Therefore, if you've placed your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can rejoice because you have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved Son. I want you to take a, a moment right now, 30, se 30 seconds, and I want you to talk with your neighbor and I want you to answer the question, what is the purpose of your salvation? What is the purpose of your salvation? Talk among yourselves for about 30 seconds, okay? Question is up on the screen.
okay? How many of you said to go to heaven when you die? No one? Few of you. That's the promise of salvation. We ask Christ to know his life and he promises eternal life. But that's not the purpose. The purpose is different. And we find that in Ephesians chapter 2.10. Look there with me, Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Or which, as the NIV says, God prepared in advance for us to do. The purpose of salvation is to demonstrate the grace of God by means of walking in good works. Habitually and continually doing good works of grace is your purpose on life and here today. My father-in-law used to say all the time, I would rather see a sermon than hear one any day. People want to see faith, not just to hear one talk about faith. In this passage, the Apostle Paul refers to those who have been saved as God's workmanship. That really means God's masterpieces or God's works of art. We are to live out our faith by being little Christs, as Luther says. We are the physical demonstration of the Savior of the world. We should have emblazoned on our chests and on our feet and on our hands that we are the representatives of Christ in this world. The word workmanship or masterpiece in Greek is the word poemia. And that's the word that we use for poem. We are God's poems, if you will. And God has created us to be a theatrical poem that says and does good works of grace in the world. That's our purpose. God's grace not only saves us, but it enables us to live the Christian life. The purpose of salvation is for us to do good works for God now in present time. John Stott also says, we are, sa we are not saved because of works, but we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. Good works which God prepared beforehand, which he designed in eternity past, for which he has fashioned us so that we should continuously walk in them. That's our purpose. We are artists painting a masterpiece with our brushes, with brilliant colors and complementary hues that proclaim the good works of grace on the canvas of life. We are poets writing stimulating prose with verse and rhyme describing the wonderful works of God's grace on the parchment of life. We are clay in the hands of the master potter who molds us and shapes us to produce good works of God's grace that are usable like a created vessel for those who do not know God. Those are our purposes to demonstrate good works. But how does God work in us? Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Christ finished his work of redemption on the cross, but he rose from the dead and returned to heaven. There... He continues to carry out the unfinished work of perfecting his church. Those people who have been saved by the grace of Christ. And Christ is equipping us to walk in good works and to demonstrate our good works by two disciplines. 
And he wants us to appropriate these two disciplines in our lives. The first discipline is the spiritual disciplines. And there's a whole cluster of spiritual dis- disciplines. And it's like every day we do our calisthenics using these spiritual disciplines in order that the Holy Spirit is using a tool that's sharpened in order for that tool to do good works. So we have the spiritual discipline of studying the Word. And there's five ways we need to work the Word over and get it into our life. We can hear it. We can, we can listen to it. We can hear it. We can read it. We can study it. We can memorize it. And we can meditate. And we can meditate on everything we hear and everything we study and everything we listen to. And we can incorporate that into our life. And then we can pray. And as we pray the Word of God and try to be people who pray according to and like the people in the Word of God prayed. And then we can do the other disciplines like uh, confession and submission and service and solitude and fasting and worship. And when we do those calisthenics each and every day, we become more and more useful in the hands of the Holy Spirit and more and more capable to do the works of good in the world, which is our purpose. And then the second discipline that the Lord uses is discipline. My son, as it says in Hebrews 12, 5, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son who he receives. The discipline of the Lord is wide and varied. He uses traffic to discipline us. He uses incorrigible co-workers to mold and shape us. He can use uh, chronic maladies such as MS, diabetes, asthma to shape the things that he wants in our lives so we can produce good works. Some of the most glorious Christians are those who are infirmed. They have learned that they can produce good works just by having godly attitudes and godly responses. Depression can be used in all sorts of things God disciplines us with in the normal ebb and flow of life. And then there's external suffering, pain, tribulation, and persecution. G.J. Chesterton said one time, Jesus promised his disciples three things. That they would be completely fearless, absurdly happy, and in constant trouble. And if it was good enough for the apostles, it's good enough for us. Your troubles are not here to plague you or to get you angry. They're here to shape you so God can perform his good works through them. We've been praying for Abdullah. He's a man who lives in Egypt. He and his wife came to faith in Christ. And all of his family and all of those he knows are Muslim. That's probably one of the most horrific things you can do to a Muslim family is to shame them and dishonor Allah by believing in Jesus. Last time I heard, Abdullah is back in the office of the secret police being interrogated. And we need to pray for him because he could be executed at any minute. It's a serious deal. We also need to pray that he can get a visa and request asylum outside of Egypt because that will be probably the only way Abdullah and his wife will ever live if they leave Egypt because they're known. And so it's a serious time for them. 
But while they're there, how do we pray for them? We pray that they won't lose their faith. They'll be like Job. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. That's what we pray for Abdullah. That he'll be encouraged in his faith. That he would not renege and would not turn his back on Christ who saved him. And that his works and his action will produce good works of grace and glory to the guards. And they will notice that Abdullah has something far more precious than they could ever have. Pray for that. And pray that God would use persecution of all types to drive us back to God. Not to jettison our faith, but to keep us pure and to keep us honest and to keep us ever true to Him. John 15, one of the most beautiful allegories in Scripture Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. Every branch that does not bear fruit, the vine dresser prunes it. That's got to hurt. So that we will bear more fruit. So let's use that discipline of discipline to become what God really wants us to be, a flowering plant that produces more fruit. Jesus is like the artisan working with lace, chisels, and sandpaper on our lives to chip and sand away everything superfluous in order to leave a masterpiece which demonstrates the grace of God. Warren Wiersbe states something about works. He says, we need to realize that there's good works in contrast to works that are darkness, works of the flesh, works that lead to death, wicked works. All of those works belong to Satan, and then good works belongs to God. If you contrast Ephesians 2.10 with Ephesians 2.2, you will see that the unbeliever has Satan working in him, and therefore his works are not good. But the believer has God working in him, and therefore his works are good. His works are not good because he himself is good, but because he has a new nature from God. He's a new creation. And because the Holy Spirit works in him and through him to produce these good works. We are dramatic poems that do not write with pen and ink, but with hands and feet. Put on a face of grace when you live and walk and have your being in this world. Be grace with skin on, as William Henderson says. Flesh everything out. Be grace to others. The first work of grace that we need to cultivate and allow the Holy Spirit to work on us is the work in our attitudes. If we have the proper attitude, then it'll, it will affect every phase and stage of life. Often we are called hypocrites by the world, and uh, that's a true statement. Everyone is a hypocrite. I being the tallest. Um, well, not, not in this room anyway. But, um, but we are all that way. But we need to ask God to give us attitudes of righteousness, not of bitterness. To allow the Spirit to work in our hearts with an attitude of love, not a love a, a attitude of anger. The people out there are not our enemies. We are brothers with them in this journey and we need to help them if they don't know Christ. We need an attitude of faith and encouragement, not an attitude of fear. We need an attitude of joy and not an attitude of sadness. Philippians 4, 8, 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, 
If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. We are to have an attitude of gratitude. We love others when they act unlovable. And we do that with a proper attitude. We accept others who are different, motivated by a proper attitude. We forgive others when they have wronged us driven by a proper attitude. We treat others right when they have treated us wrongly because our attitude is correct. Not only do we allow God to change our attitudes, but we allow him to change our words. Proper attitude is the first way we want God to change us and work through us, and then our words. Words are extremely important. We know that probably more than any generation who listens to the political scene. You can destroy people with words. Scripture says a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Change us, O God, to be a church that compliments instead of a church that complains. Change us, O God, to have proper speech in everything we do. We are a people who emphasizes what is good, not what is bad. We uplift. We do not tear down. This is Mother's Day, and I want to give a shout-out to all the mothers. Where would we be without mothers? I never had a dad. Where would I be without my mom? I'd probably be in the gutter without her. Mothers are nurturers. Wonderful that God provided us human beings with mothers and women who nurture. There was a greeting card company that sent to all the prisons on one Mother's and Father's Day cards so the inmates could use them and give them out to their mothers and their dads. On Mother's Day, there was not one card left The card company sent thousands and thousands of cards and they were all used because all the inmates know mom loves me and mom encourages me. So the card company thought, well, we got to be prepared for Father's Day and they sent all these cards for Father's Day and in every prison there was only maybe one card taken and they had to send all those cards back. Well, I'm ashamed to be named a father if that's how we treat people. But that's how inmates are treated by their dads. But it is so loving to know that um, the women treated those inmates with love. And they nurtured them. And they did acts of righteousness. Let's do that as well. Let's be people of righteousness. I'd like to exhort the mothers. That's one of my gifts, I guess, is exhortation. It's hard to raise kids. It's hard to love husbands. And mothers are naturally nurturers. But after a while of trying to raise kids going this way and always running after them going that way, and having a husband that sometimes you just like to pinch his head off. I know it sometimes it's really difficult for mothers to stay nurturers. But don't stop. Don't let your good work of nurturing slide into words of contempt and criticism. Because you're not made for that. God made you to produce the good work of nurturing and encouraging and loving and I shout out and say thank you for doing that and then we are to do acts of righteousness doing good works with our deeds and let's anticipate the surprises we know that when we drive sooner or later we're going to see a motorist who's on the side of the road who needs our help let's not just tune that out let's prepare for that and be ready to be used by God. We know that when we go to downtown Denver, we're going to run into indigents who are going to ask you for money. It even happened to me at Casa Bonita the other day. Let's be ready for that. 
buy them a sandwich. Be prepared. We know that's going to happen. We know that LDS missionaries and Jehovah Witnesses missionaries are going to show up at our door. Let's invite them in. Let's give them a cup of a glass of iced tea. Ask them to share their story and why they're Mormon. And then ask them if we can share our story. Prepare for those surprises that come. And as we do, we're working with the Holy Spirit to do good works in the world. And then be prepared to use your home. You know what the word hospitality means? It's a compound word that means love, stranger. And it really means love, a stranger. We need to leverage our homes that God has given to us. Instead of treating our homes like a fortress that no one can get in and the things in here are valuable, let's open up the windows and the doors and say to people, come on in. Whatever I have, it's not that valuable. You're much more valuable. I don't know if you've ever been to Naples, Italy, but it's a tough town. And if you go to Naples, you'll probably be robbed. They'll even take the earrings off of your ears sometimes. That's happened to our colleagues. But it's so funny in Naples. You go into the apartment buildings in Naples, and you walk up each platform, each floor, and you go up to the first floor, and the doors are open to the homes. Go up to the second floor, all the doors are open. Third floor, all the doors are open. And even though the Neapolitans live in violence outside, they say, come on in. I want to meet you. I want to be your friend. I want to know you. Let's leverage our homes. My wife, she's a super baker. And when we were in Italy, she baked everybody a birthday cake. And we invited people to share it in our home. Do those acts that leverage your home so you can get to know people and share the good works that God has performed and programmed in you to do. Max Lucado says, Do you have a front door? A table? Chairs? Bread and meat for sandwiches? Congratulations! You are now qualified to serve in the most ancient of ministries, hospitality. Let's use our homes and our bodies to perform good works. We are to be masterpieces on display for the world. You know what's tragic about that story, Salvatore Mundi, the picture that was paid, uh, was purchased for $450.3 million? It's still in a vault. They think it's still in Geneva. What good is a priceless painting if it stays in a vault? It was supposed to be placed in the Louvre in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates two years ago, but it's still in a vault. We are to be masterpieces that people can see and touch and feel and not remain in our homes that are locked. We are to go out to the world and share the good works of Christ because that is what he created us to do. And we need to leverage that for his good glory. Let's practice our position in Christ. He has worked for you. Now let us have him work in us and through us that he might give us an exciting, creative life for the glory of God. We are saved to be actors who on the stage of life act out a dramatic poem that proclaims the works of God.